honesty and openness. After we have experienced restoration with those we've hurt, we must continue to have open, honest relationships in order to avoid recurring problems. Here now is Dr. Gene Getz. The setting, briefly, is that Jacob and Esau, after their bitter time of anger and all of those things that went with that period of time, they had a wonderful reunion, a wonderful time of, of reconciliation. And after that was over, we have an interesting paragraph recorded for us in Genesis 33, 12 to 14. Then Esau said, Let's move on, and I'll go ahead of you. And Jacob replied, My Lord knows that the children are weak, and I have nursing sheep and cattle, and if they're driven hard for one day, the whole herd will die. And let's give uh, Jacob the benefit of the doubt here. But I think from the context, already he is conniving and he's not being open, he's not being honest because he has another plan. And so he, he says uh, to his brother, let my Lord go ahead of his servant. I will continue on slowly at a pace suited to the livestock and the children until I come to my Lord at Seir. In other words, I'll follow behind and I'll catch up with you. I'll get there later, but uh, the reason is that I just can't move that quickly because of the situation. Well, what was in the mind of Jacob? When did that come into his mind? We're not totally sure, but we read in verses 16 and 17 on that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. But, that's the key, but Jacob went on to Sukkoth. He went on to Sukkoth. I don't think that he really had in his mind that he was going to catch up with his brother or meet him there. Because he settled in. He built a house for himself and stalls for his cattle. That is why the place was called Sukkoth. Now this, this raises, I think, some interesting questions. Number one is why wasn't Jacob honest with Esau? I, I think there are probably a couple of reasons for that, but one reason could be it takes time to change old patterns of behavior that are sinful. And Jacob had been a deceiver for a long, long time. And even though there was this reunion, this reconciliation between the two brothers, is it possible that he just regressed to his old patterns of behavior? That's a possibility. I think there's another reason. Second question, I think, which sets the stage for this possibility. If he were afraid that living together so closely might open old wounds, then why didn't he trust God to protect him if he told Esau the whole truth? Even if it hurt his brother's feelings. In other words, another possibility is that he may have thought, boy, we've had all this tension for all these years and I don't want to take a risk. I don't want to be too close. Separation is better. Distance is better. But if that was true, why didn't he tell him the truth? Well, I think the real possibility relates to fear. To answer these questions that we just raised, we must remember how easy it is to be less than honest when we're fearful of another person's reactions. I'm sure all of us have felt that. I think there are times that we choose a route for communication that is safe because we're afraid that maybe face-to-face -face communication will be too complicated, too tense, and so we kind of circumvent that and if we're not careful, we don't tell the whole truth in the process. And so fear is, is an incredibly difficult kind of motivation and particularly makes us susceptible uh, because of tension in the past and the pain that goes along with all of that tension. And our memories can be very, very easily activated even though years in the past things have happened that made us feel, have made us feel very, very uncomfortable. Those feelings can be under the surface. And boy, when something comes along that's very similar, brings back all those old memories, it's like it's right there taking over your personality. And so I think we all have to be aware of that because that can cause us to be less than honest and certainly, in this case, 
Jacob was not honest. As I think about um, Jacob, as I think about Esau, as I think about these Old Testament characters, I have to compare the advantages that we have as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, in our marriages, in our families, in our relationships with one another. And our great advantage is our relationship in Jesus Christ. And Paul spoke to that in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, when he says, But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Him who is the head, Christ. Speaking what? The truth. But speaking the truth in love. And then he goes on to say and explain what our advantage is over even Jacob and Esau. From Him, that is Christ, the whole body. We're a family from the whole body fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. And one of the unique advantages that we have as believers in Jesus Christ is that we understand forgiveness in a way that Jacob and Esau never understood forgiveness. Because we have the greatest example in all the world for forgiveness, and that's God Himself through His Son, Jesus Christ. And in the Scriptures, we are told in the New Testament to forgive one another as Christ forgave us. And we have that great advantage, that model, that example, to be imitators of Christ. But we also have the indwelling Holy Spirit to enable us to live as we ought to live, if indeed we yield ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in His will as we should. Building up one another. And there's so many statements in the New Testament that relate to the one another's. Things that we're to do for one another. To be devoted to one another and brotherly love. To, be, to honor one another above our, ourselves. And to be unified in, in ways and to forgive one another. Accept one another. And uh, so all of these are great blessings in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians, a uh, principle emerges there. Principle 9 that we've outlined from the study in Ephesians, in order to become mature in Christ as local communities of faith, we must all function as members of one another. And part of that relates to this experience here in the Old Testament, that is, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven us. So the question for reflection and response, when is it wise and proper to withhold information including our own negative feelings, simply to avoid creating pain in another person's life. Now this question, see, raises a balance because there are some people who think that if you don't share with another person everything you're feeling, you're not being honest. And that can be a rather devastating kind of modus operandi in terms of relationships. There's a a secular view that some Christians have bought into, and it goes something like this, and I've seen this with certain Christians. When they think to themselves, or they say to you, this is how I feel, and if you can't handle it, it's your problem. Have you ever heard that? Well, that has grown right out of secular psychology, and certainly does not grow out of the Bible, to say, you know, this is how I feel, and if you can't handle it, it's your problem, not my problem. First of all, uh, when you look at a statement like that, it's a very distorted view of speaking the truth in love. Very distorted view, because speaking the truth in love at times means that you withhold certain thoughts or ideas or even feelings out of deference and love for another person. Now, one of the ways in which you can figure that out is to have another objective listener where you can say to somebody else, this is how I'm feeling, are my feelings based on reality, or am I just reacting and distorted? And I've seen situations in my own experience where the person says, Gene, that's not a reality. And what happens? It diffuses the feelings. So there's no reason for me to go to another person and say, this is how I feel. There may be an opportunity to say, this is how I once felt, when you're in a more objective discussion. But speaking the truth in love is discerning. Now, on the other hand, sharing our feelings is appropriate when it's based on reality, 
and it's something we need to share. But one of the things that is so important here is that when we share feelings, we share them in a way that doesn't threaten the other individual. For example, when someone says to you, this is how I feel, that is much, much uh, less threatening to the receiver than when you say, you make me feel this way. There is a big difference. One is very judgmental, very direct. The other is, this is how I feel. And it's very hard to deny a person feelings. And so you can explore the reasons for that. So it takes a lot of wisdom to be able to uh, make sure that we continue to maintain good relationships after restoration has taken place. So let me just share that principle again. After we've experienced restoration with those we've hurt, we must continue to have open, honest relationships in order to avoid recurring problems. Open, honest relationships is a very, very important point, but it takes wisdom on how to speak the truth in love and to maintain those relationships in a Christ-like way. <laughs>